Welcome to Residential Tech Talks. I'm Jeremy Glowacki, Executive Editor of Residential Tech Today. On this week's podcast, our contributing editor, Michael Heiss, joins us from his home in Los Angeles to talk about the recent consumer electronics show and some of the latest TV technology developments and other smart home products that he thinks are worth knowing about. Neither one of us traveled to Las Vegas for CES this year, but we followed the virtual announcements and press releases very closely and we'll attempt today to distill down what we learned from all of that information. We'll talk broader TV technology trends and also try to break it down a bit more brand by brand. There's no one better suited to do that than our guest today, who is not only a CDF Fellow and Lifetime Achievement Award winner, but also one of the foremost experts on consumer and broadcast video technology. Michael Heiss, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, you know, I may be a fellow, but I guess that means I'm jolly good. Oh, nice. Yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> First off, um, I know you really wanted to attend CES in person. Oh, I, could, I could see it in your texts and your your uh, emails and, and that dang variant thing happened and it just wasn't a good idea and you stayed home like I did and, and, and watched it from afar. But uh, I, I think we did see a lot of... Uh, a lot of things come to fruition that we talked about even a year ago on this podcast as far as technology trends and video, uh, things coming to actual products for the first time. Uh, well, last or, year. Yeah, so what, yeah. What, what, what are we seeing that was we talked about last year that we saw on products finally? Yeah, and, and I, I really agree. I didn't go. You might say there was a little spousal pressure in there, <laughs> yeah. um, but this is the first time in 45 years that uh, – uh, I didn't go to CES and, you know, I kind of regret it, but I'm able to sit here and say I had a negative test. So uh, I'm glad I didn't go. Yeah, this I think it, there's a theme that uh, you've really pointed out that this is the year of stuff really happening. Uh, things that have either been under the covers that popped up in a reel or things that were shown as technology demos that were for real and if not available now will be absolutely available within the next couple of months uh going into the fall selling season atsc 3.0 hdmi 2.1 uh qd oled um faster monitors uh emphasis on gaming i, I think just across the board in terms of video those were definitely uh the highlights um more sets with uh, the ability to hook up a camera so that you could do uh, video conferencing through a big screen, which as anybody uh, knows from the last you know 18 months to uh, uh, two years, uh, that's been really important. I, I wish I had that. And uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> It's real life, Michael. It's, it's yeah. Gonna all right. I, I I presume that that Alan can edit that, and of course, just for let me turn the ringer off. <laughs> we and know you're last... of that. We know you're that generation now that gets the phone call. So that was Marge. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you're both of that generation. That yeah. Thanks that a lot. The phone. <laughs> all right. Um. How do you want to pick it up? I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So, so do, I think we can continue. And we just, Alan and I talk about real life on podcasts, and that's real life. So, let's just keep on going. C continue, as you were saying about. All right. Uh, so, um, you know, clearly smart TV, um, is sort of as a generic category, that's something that's been around uh, everywhere. But what we're starting to see, or what reappeared this year, is the notion of the TV set again as the center of uh, the activity and home control, where a lot of people have been saying, yeah, who watches a big TV anymore? It's all phones and tablets. Well, where have you been for the last 24 months? You've been home. And yes, maybe you've been on the couch, you know, with a you know, with one of these up to your uh, up to your face, but you wanted to lay back and watch it on a big screen. And where that's taking, particularly with uh, some of the major manufacturers, um, let's see, LG and Samsung, and surprisingly, TCL, which isn't in the appliance market um, pretty much, if at all, in the United States, but is in other parts of the world. And 
uh, part of their presentation uh, before the show was to demonstrate an on-screen uh, tableau of the various devices in the home. And another trend is voice control built into the TV set, not just in the remotes, as a control surface, if you will, for all the connected devices in the house. Good news, bad news. Good news, it's there. Bad news, at least for now, and we'll wait to see over the course of the year how matter uh, really comes into play. But the LG set was great. Their idea was great. And I just put new LG appliances in my kitchen. So theoretically, I could sit in front of an LG TV and talk to the air purifier and, and, and talk to the range and start the dishwasher and all of that. But what if I have another brand of whatever the category of appliance is? And that walled garden thing with regard to in-TV voice control or remote control of other smart home devices kind of still in a state of flux. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you think that these features just they get a little carried away with with things unrelated to the performance of the television. You know, like what what consumers are going to want to actually expand into these other categories and where does it really work with what the reality of their other brands are? So that that's a good point there. But interesting to know how they're trying to to, to make their their TVs more like a media center or a controller for the home as well. When you talk um, actual video technology, everywhere, every release was mini LED. Um, it seemed like across the manufacturers, um, was mini LED more of a of a talking point last year and a real reality this year, or was it already kind of underway with products in the market last year? Well, it, it first started to appear about two years ago. And now it's broadened across pretty much all of the major brands that have got mini LED products. There are still some that aren't. And if you look sort of on the, the far end of that, there is the micro LED and Samsung, uh, which has sort of really been at the forefront from a commercialization standpoint in the consumer and custom markets with the wall. Um, as have other brands, to be sure. But they've had a set, it. they uh, showed a set that was 88 inches. But that's still, um, if you have to ask, you can't afford it kind of thing. Yeah, and it's, right. it's really nice. But mini LED, that's a, th that's a thing. And, you know, the next TV set that I buy, I'll definitely look for something with mini LED because you want the brightness, you want the increased... Uh, control and uh, more dimming zones. So th that's a big talking point. The other thing that continued is some of the technology sort of becomes not the same, but it's common across all brands. If you're a TV brand, how do you differentiate, differentiate your offerings from everybody else's? Or if you're a, um, a residential uh, technology professional, how do you explain to the client's why this one and not that one? And one of the things that continues to be promoted is the processing. And mm -hmm. each brand promoted their, you know, blabbit central processor. Um, and they each had their different names. And it's interesting because there's no real way for the user to, sh to compare them other than this brand, that brand, that designation. But the processor at the heart of the TV set is what enables it to do all of this cool stuff. And there was a very distinct um, sort of sectionalization in terms of tiers of processor capabilities within the individual brand's model lines. Well, we'll uh, continue our conversation. I want to get a break in because I know once we get started talking, Michael, we, we could go forever on this stuff. So um, we will return with our conversation with Michael Heiss after a short break. Did you know that 34% of broadband households are concerned about the air quality inside of their homes? 
Parks Associates' new quantified consumer study, Fresh Air, Air Quality and Comfort in the Smart Home, addresses consumer concern regarding indoor air quality as well as interest in air quality products and services. Our research of 10,000 broadband households finds that about 20% of broadband households are likely to purchase a smart climate or indoor air quality device in the next six months. This new consumer analysis quantifies concerns, perception of product value, and purchase intentions. For more information on fresh air, air quality, and comfort in the smart home, contact sales at parksassociates.com. Welcome back. Um, we're talking with Michael Heiss. He's a video expert. He's a contributing editor to Residential Tech Today, CEDIA Lifetime Achievement Award winner, and fellow fellow. Michael, let's uh, continue what we were talking about with the technology um, and and finding that way to differentiate these brands. They they. I, I had an uncle, my uncle, who who knows a little tiny bit about technology and then likes to spend money but not real money on technology. And he wants a new TV. Hi, I said, they're kind of getting to be a lot of the same thing. It's hard to say, get this brand over that brand. I do have my favorites, but you're not going to really go wrong these days. There's so many good options out there for someone who maybe doesn't want to spend a ton of money. And I, I always say OLED is still the best I, I would recommend, but you may not want to spend that amount of money mini led comes along and i guess it's trying to be as good as oled um and and providing backlight technology that's accurate the thing i i waited so long to get a new tv because i had a plasma that i loved i knew that it wasn't as, as as sharp it wasn't 4k of course and i i i get to these dark scenes and movies now and there's the, the, my example is a little uh campfire in a scene the rest of the screen is supposed to be black there's a little fire burning in the corner and I get that banding going on and and it and I know that wouldn't be there if I had OLED and it drives me crazy so the, those types of things you're trying to overcome those like last little details right with the with the improvements in picture yeah, but, now. you know whether you're a consumer listening to this and in the situation as as your uncle or a professional trying to determine what to uh, specify to a client before one would get to this brand, that brand, or another brand, it goes back to the, the really essential thing for all of this, which is what are the requirements of the room? Um, we're thinking, you know, marry an architect, stop her before she builds again. We're thinking of, of reconfiguring the house and moving the den into a large living room that has a lot more light. So what am I going to, I'd love an OLED but I really need something that has a bright picture because mm. there's just too much light in the room and she likes to keep the windows open. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if you really want the precision that an OLED uh, delivers in terms of contrast, will you sacrifice a little brightness in terms of contrast? Some people will, some people won't. Um, gaming what, requirements, right? Yeah. What do you like? Do you, are you, are you a sports fan? Are you a gamer? Or do you just like watching movies or television that looks like movies these days? So yeah. And those, then those based on that, then you can go brand A, brand C, brand D, because most of the brands and particularly now that not available in the market quite yet, but now that Samsung has joined the, uh, OLED bandwagon, with uh, their new QD OLED, and those will be available, uh, I suspect, you know, kind of more towards the fall because they haven't really announced any hard products or, or pricing. But if you look at Sony, LG, Samsung, they both offer both mini LED and OLED. Which one is better? And, you know, yes, people ask me the same question. I'm supposed to know this stuff. Which one is better? And the answer is, you mean, which one is better for me or which one is better for you? Yeah. What's better for one is not better for the other. And that's where there's some caution advised, particularly as, as an advisor, as you are and, and I am, in a time period where a lot of people don't want to go to the store. Mm -hmm. um, and you're taking a risk and saying, well, I recommend this brand with this technology and this model level, go down and look at it or come to my showroom. Oh, no, I'll buy it online. The notion now, 
I'm old. I mean, there, there's no doubt about it. The notion of buying a large, expensive TV set online without seeing it is is totally foreign to me as much as, you know, you want to buy a new car. Um, Tesla doesn't have showrooms. I mean, they do, but it's a pain in it's a pain in the neck. Uh, put a reservation down and commit yourself to buying one of the new EVs that are coming out. Wait, you mean I haven't driven the car yet, and you want me to buy it unseen, undriven? Same right. same applies here. So it it makes it difficult, and you know, sort of a a word of caution to anybody who is advising a friend, a relative, or a client about a TV purchase. Um, you know, your mileage may vary. Right. Absolutely. I, I got a kick out of what we'll, we'll go brand by brand a little bit here, and I'm not going to go in an or alphabetical order or, or brand hierarchy or anything like that. I'm just going to grab things that I was putting in my notes as I went. Um, but the, I got a kick out of the TCL uh, press release because, uh, they, they started describing, um, the color you get from their quantum dot technology. Um, and, and they started describing it like you're like there's for sales clerks at Shane company, they're talking color contrast and clarity now, uh, for their, for their screens. And, uh, it's just like, and a are important. I know. And it's funny, you know, when you bought, bought your, the one time you had to buy a diamond for your, your, your future fiance, we, we learned all about those three things, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, or, 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 you know, if you're, if you're, you know, you've been married multiple times, I get that that happens a lot. Now, now. You and I, we, we, we've had the one time, 40, um, year, 40 years. Congratulations. That's awesome. We're, we're going on 20 soon. So, um, so I, I guess, uh, wh what would you say, uh, some of the things that stood out, we'll, we'll start with TCL. If you, if you can recall some of what their, what, what would you say was the standout, uh, um, announcements or features that they discussed specifically for that brand? Well, they're big on mini LED to be sure. And that okay. they're pushing that down through the line structure and more of their sets will have it, uh, going forward. Uh, they're very big on, as you'll hear this repeated as, uh, virtually all of the manufacturers are, they're very big on features or a game mode. What does that mm -hmm. mean? It means right. faster refresh. And, you know, hey, remember, you know, NTSC 29.98, you know, and that, and that's it. And 60, 60 frame. Wow, that was cool. But now 120 in, in any decent TV set is kind of standard. But uh, TCL, as did some of the other manufacturers, were promoting uh, 144 hertz uh, refresh. Uh, those are the kinds of things where maybe not any huge new technology, but way they put them in the mixer and press the pulse button. And when you pour it out, what does it look like? So, and, and TCL uh, clearly is, is a top selling brand. Uh, they, you know, they claim that um, one third of the U S TV sales in 60 inch and above in the U S were theirs. They're clearly a leader in um, smart TVs uh, through their connection with Roku, although they're also uh, offering Google TV. So that's, um, you know, that's really going to be their push uh, for this year. No ATSC 3.0 yet, um, but I think eventually it, it's definitely going to be there. So to dive in a little deeper on these features, the, the, the refresh rate, um, what's a gamer get out of that? They're, they're getting... Uh, fewer um smoother action yeah so it doesn't pixelate if things move quickly and that it, type it of thing it doesn't blur and you blur. know jiggle jaggle but what goes in line with that is the uh vrr variable refresh rate function uh that's part of uh hdmi 2.1 where if the game is presenting an image that's refreshing faster then the TV set is able to handle the VRR sort of mitigates that by allowing the TV to catch up with this video source from the game so that you don't see stuttering or, mm -hmm. you know, just motion artifacts. 
because one thing is moving faster uh, than the other. So if you're a gamer, yeah, you want something with as high a frame rate as possible. But you definitely want something with VRR or some measure of variable refresh rate. Uh, TCL did not promote it, but the some of the other brands uh, promoted um, uh, FreeSync or GeForce, which are from AMD and uh, NVIDIA, which are another uh, way that they've been able to help glue things together so that what's mm. coming out of the game... And in fact, actually, I even have to digress because remember that not all gamers are PlayStations and Xboxes. Um, one of the other things that the pandemic world has brought is a big increase in PC game. Mm. And if you're uh, dealing with somebody that has a gamer PC with a high-end video card, like an NVIDIA and some of the others, um, they're putting out amazing video but you want to make sure that the device that it's being viewed on is is able to accommodate it. And when you mention Google TV, <laughs> that's come up a bit in some of these releases. Um, uh, that is basically their uh, their user interface then on the TV. Is that what the Google TV relationship is? Explain yeah, what that I means. mean it's uh, each of the brands, each of the TV set brands, like Sony, for example, and and TCL that use. Uh, Google TV. They customize it, <coughs> excuse me, a little, but I mean, because I, I do what I do, I've got a bucket full of Roku's and Fire TVs and, and Google TVs and NVIDIA Shield. And it's the way that the streaming material is presented to you. But one of the things that I really caution, again, anybody recommending or purchasing a TV set is Google TV, it's good. Fire TV, it's good. Although I'm not a fan particularly of their sets at the moment, their screen, streaming devices are, are quite good. And Roku, of course, is you know really one of the leaders in that, at least in the uh, U.S. domestic market. But one of the things you want to look at is, are there any apps that are not in, for example, the... Google Play Store or mm. in Roku or in the um, Apple TV Store or in uh, the Fire TV. A good example of that is the Spectrum app. I, uh, the cable company that services the area where I live is uh, Spectrum. And if I get tired, which I have of paying too much money for set-top boxes, I've installed the Spectrum app on my Roku TV and my Roku boxes and my Apple TV, I'd love to install it on the Google TV products. You can't, for whatever reason, they don't offer that app. And if that's something that is significant to a particular user, that could be a make or break feature, regardless of the other fine qualities that a particular set might have. So moving on brands here, LG uh, was the next one I wrote down, and it was one of the things that caught my eye was the um, the very large OLED model. They had they had a ninety seven inch OLED model um, yep. to complement their fifty five, sixty five, and seventy seven. So that that seems to be a, a pretty cool technology accomplishment because we remember OLED started very small, um, and and now we're up to potentially a 97 inch TV. Um, obviously LG known for their great lives, their, their like sort of designer brands, the, the wall, the frame, uh, those, those technologies that just really, uh, do beautiful, uh, accompaniment to, to interior design. Um, what stood out to you, uh, regarding LG, uh, around at CES? Well, I'm just looking at my notes from, from their presentation, they're, you know, clearly um, promoting their new processor. Their latest and greatest version is the Alpha fifth generation Alpha 9. But they're, uh, and they're using that to do a, a lot of cool things. Although when you think of OLED, 
you think of LG because LG Display, not LG Electronics, who are the folks that actually sell the products. LG Display is the manufacturing company that builds the OLED panels, and they, you know, are pretty much uh, owning that space. You think of LG, you think of OLED, you think of OLED, you think of LG. So everybody would have thought that they were going to get on this QD OLED bandwagon, and they didn't, at least not for now. But they have changed. They have what's called EVO, EVO, which is their new uh, formulation OLED that will give it better performance and better brightness and all the the cool stuff. And, you know, that's that's their competition. But they equally promoted uh, their um, nanocell technology or QNED. Um, and it, again, it's all of these things. You almost need a, a decoder ring to translate the branding of a technology to to what it is. Um, they promoted their game optimizer. And another thing that people, if you're a gamer, um, games are the primary source, perhaps the only source of 8K content that requires the bandwidth of uh, HDMI 2.1 at this point. Depending upon which chips uh, are in a particular set, the maximum is 48 uh, gigabits per second. Some of the chips are only 40. Does it make a difference? It depends. It depends on what you're using the set for. And one of the things that, uh, you know, I underlined in my notes is that LG uh, is providing the full 48 uh, gigabit uh, transmission rate. Another thing, though, also is you get down into which set, which brand is how many 2.1 inputs are there. Some hmm. sets, there'll be all the inputs. Some, there'll only be some of them. You know, it's something uh, to look out for. Uh, what else from LG? Um, a lot of uh, moves towards increasing the audio. And, you know, again, mm -hmm. the, the world that I'm sure the people uh, listening to or watching this podcast, uh, you're all going to have or you're going to be involved with big audio systems. And one of the selling points has always been, yeah, the little crappy speakers built into a, a single uh, flat panel TV because they're so thin. All of the manufacturers, and LG is one of them, have made um, quite uh, significant advances in attempting to improve the sound quality coming out of a TV set without an external audio system or a sound bar. At the end of the day, uh, the late great Henry, Henry Kloss uh, had an old saying, there's no replacement for displacement. And that more referred to subwoofers, but in general, you need to move the air uh, behind and around the driver and a speaker. Hard to do as the um, countervailing ideas to get a set that it's thin as possible. But that's a long-winded way of saying that um, LG was promoting the audio performance of their TV sets as much uh, as their video. And that's a great step because obviously uh, when you get rid of the bezel, which happened years ago, you lose the speakers on the sides, you try to put it behind the screen, and then everybody starts putting in external speakers and some people don't want that and you're left with terrible audio and and you have to get a sound bar um so so that that's great to be able to start reincorporating in better quality audio when when we move on to sony um next up in my list uh one of the things that i that stood out just as a unique item was this bravia cam uh it, it's not what you'd expect. It's not just a video conference, but it actually sees where users are sitting and optimizes the picture and sound accordingly. The um, it, it does include gesture controls, video chat, and other uh, new experiences waiting to be explored. Um, but I thought that was interesting, just to try to improve the uh, the user experience uh, by adjusting to the room uh, and the people sitting in the room. So that did. Um, that that was one thing uh quickly i i noted that a lot of the manufacturers are talking about sustainability this year on the video not, side oh not a lot of them all of them and, exactly and again not having physically gone to ces but watching it you know through uh through video conferences the lead off to 
all of these presentations, and some of them were, were quite lavishly produced, was sustainability, which is, you know, which is terrific. You know, I'm, yeah, I'm all yeah. for it. Um, but they were promoting, all the manufacturers were promoting that um, in, in various uh, forms. And um, it, it's interesting in, in what we would generically call the CEDIA world, at one point, uh, LEED, L-E-E-D, which is a sort of a rating uh, mechanism uh, to verify the sustainability or the um, what the degree of environmental impact of a building is. Um, LEED was a big deal, and that's sort of, you know, that's sort of, it's still there, but it's sort of not promoted as much. But Samsung, in, in particular, not to skip ahead of your list, but uh, Samsung, you know, is has gone so far, and this is a year or two old, but to not only like most of the rest of the manufacturers go to unbleached uh, uh, cartons without the, you know, without any color printing, but to allow the consumer to reuse in the reduce, reuse, recycle um, a, a triangle to convert the box into a table or, mm -hmm. you know, some other uh, thing so that you just don't throw it uh, in the trash. And Samsung was very big on that, but all of the manufacturers were, were extremely, extremely big on uh, sustainability. Yeah, and, and I, I, if, if you, I'm sorry, if you don't mind my, my running to the start of the S list, because you said you were going to go okay. to Sony. Uh, one of the interesting things that uh, Samsung had is an LV harvesting remote control. So that, you know, no batteries required and batteries oh, are, right. you know, a big uh, part of um, of waste. And what are you going to do with them? And they're not easily recyclable. So that was just sort of an interesting way of um, of doing that. And an RF harvesting remote, uh, you know, that's that's pretty cool. And, uh, and just if I can continue down my notes from yeah. Samsung, um, you mentioned the Sony Bravia cam. And that's a really good example of an application of AI. And that's mm. a big buzzword now. But what is the artificial intelligence used for? And different manufacturers, given the ability and capability of the processors in their uh, products, what they're able to do with it is interesting. So Sony was using it for uh, different things in the Bravia cam. What LG did is one of the things they're using is the ability to adjust the um, window for an ASL sign language uh, mm. translator so that if it's there, it, it's there. But if there isn't anybody with a hearing impairment, it's just, you know, kind of down in the corner. But if it's something that's important to a particular uh, viewer, uh, then you can adjust it so that you have a better view of of what the sign language interpreter is is doing and and again just uh, looking at my notes so here's a direct quote out of the samsung presentation tv is still the entertainment center of the home period mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you know reports of tv's death by tablets and smartphones i think quite frankly to paraphrase Mark Twain, is greatly exaggerated. Well, an announced by a TV manufacturer, by the way, but and also the, wow. the, the, the manufacturer that thought that the 3D was going to be the wave of the future as well. But well, we, but won't be, know, we won't be cynical. <laughs> not, well, so, uh, hey, you know, be cynical. I'm here. But, you know, here's another interesting thing that was a big deal a while ago, but has now come back in a different form or curved monitors. Oh, by the way, 3D, I, I think uh, in the immortal words of uh, the late, great Chick Hearn, you can stick a fork in that. That's that that's done. Curved, which, uh, you know, was a big deal five, six, seven years ago. And then it's sort of wet away. Curved is definitely coming back in gaming monitors or work from home productivity monitors. And virtually all of the major brands had curved monitors, 32 inch and larger. So mm -hmm. where we once sort of scoffed at curved 
TV sets, everybody wants them as a gaming or work from home monitor. Okay. Well, one of the things that stood yeah. out with with Samsung while we're still there is uh, the multi view. Um, four different sources simultaneously approached with the HDMI ports, and I mean, we we go way back to picture in picture, and it goes away when when digital comes along. It's just kind of one of those things that was great, and then then they just took it away from us to get back to doing that without having to have all of the background backup systems that you do on the consumer c custom installation side to make that happen uh, um, absolutely and and i that was a feature that i missed uh, you know going okay. back to the point of i i dare say in 1976 uh one of the magazines i was uh, writing for at the time had me do a test of a sampo set with three screens a big screen a big a big 21 inch screen and two nine inch monitors built into the same cat cabinet how cool was that if you're a sports junkie and you want to watch you know the final four is is coming up if you want to watch all the different you know games at once some of the services pr provide that but mm -hmm. if you've got a multi-view that's cool if um you're a news junkie which i really am and you want to watch uh you know god help you cnn fox and msnbc and c-span all at the same time, you know, being able to listen to them all at the same time, you know, you'd be carting me off in a straitjacket. But <laughs> multi-view, um, that's that's a cool feature. You know, that's something yeah. that would tip the scales for me. Yeah. And, and you, you mentioned the AI. Uh, just one of the notes I took was Samsung's um, eye comfort mode, which uh, automatically adjusts the screen's brightness and tone based on built-in light sensors and sunset and sunrise information, which I thought that was really an interesting idea. I, I find that sometimes my, my screen, especially when commercials come on with my, with my big 60 inch, 65 inch monitor, uh, TV that my, my eyes are just burning sometimes cause the damn thing's so bright. Um, so, and, and of course the blue light thing, uh, you know, at night, but, uh, I thought that was an interesting uh, use of the, I guess that would be considered the AI. Um, yeah, sure. And and before we leave uh, Samsung, one of, I think, maybe even more than the um, QD OLED, which has received a lot of coverage, I think that particularly in the popular media, the one product that they had that's received more coverage than anything else was not a flat panel display, but the freestyle portable projector. Yes. And uh, I used to be in the projection business and one of the tubes, let alone the unit in the projectors that the company I ran, uh, you know, used, this projector is smaller than those tubes, but it's a 1080p portable use anywhere, um, uh, use anywhere product in terms of uh, the shape. You can think of it as about the size of a track light uh, can. Yeah. And you carry it around. I, I think a lot of people are going to be hanging sheets on the side of the house and watching video outside, or you can point it up at the ceiling and watch, uh, you know, watch stuff in bed, or uh, you can use it for projection mapping if you want to light up uh, a solid object. Um, it's a great idea. I think it, automatic uh, keystone and leveling autofocus. 30 inch to 100 inch screen. Uh, I think that that's, uh, that's going to, it'll be interesting to see if it will be, but I think that that's going to be a really, really big hit. Yeah. They, they were pushing really hard for that prior to the show. And I, uh, I was on the Resi Week podcast this week as well. And we talked about it. It's, it's really a, a, a hedging toward that Gen Z uh, demographic. I think, you know, let's say, the TV is the center, but what if it's not the center of our lifestyle anymore, or at least the next generation? Well, here's something that may appeal to that to the kid that's looking at the iPad or or their laptop as their TV source these days, and uh, they can they can lay on the bed and shine it up at that ceiling or do whatever they want and take it with them. And it and it just it, it's it's an interesting play on their part, I think, um, if you look at it from a business standpoint. And it's a very cool technology to be able to. Yeah, it is. It really is. Um, so um, 
Do you uh, do you want to touch on anything with Sony that we didn't hit because we kind of went back and well, forth with Sony was a weird bird. Sony and LG took a, a particularly interesting stance with regard to their displays. They went to CES, but they didn't go to CES. Uh, the LG booth, as as I see in the pictures and was told by acquaintances who was there, was the same basic space that they've used for the past few years, but there was nothing there except uh, freeform plywood sort of alcoves and QR codes. No people, no mm. products. And I understand why, and I don't blame them for it. They're they're good people, and, and one might say that they did the right thing, but you couldn't see the products. Sony had a few products, but a bunch of people were asking me, so what TV sets did they show? And the answer is they didn't show any. They made a big deal about the QD OLED, but you couldn't see it. It wasn't, it may have been hiding in a back room somewhere. So people say, what was Sony's uh, big uh, thing at the show? They showed their new car, which, and you can mark this one down in the records. I still don't think, although that Sony announced a mobility uh, company and they showed a second generation uh, electric uh, SUV, which is great. I probably can't be able to afford it, but I don't think they're actually going to sell cars any more than Apple's been rumored to be working on a car for years. But, you know, I haven't seen one on the road and I live in Los Angeles for crying out loud and we got everything here. But Sony is probably one of the largest manufacturers of sensors and semiconductors used that enable all of the features that an advanced vehicle wants. But that car was right there and it got a lot of press. Um, that does sort of go not to a TV set itself, but to a component is that at the ATSC uh, press event, they announced that Sony is coming out with some specialized uh, semiconductors that one of them is called Clover that will be used to facilitate ATSC 3.0 next gen TV in moving vehicles as well as in stationary applications. And one of the big advantages of ATSC 3.0 over the current standard or the, the 1.0 standard is it actually works in moving vehicles and the mm. current standard just kind of does it. And that at past NAB shows, I, I've seen that. And it, it's, uh, it's pretty dramatic. And Sony is uh, producing semi or will be offering very soon semiconductors that in conjunction with all the other things they make that may facilitate uh, TV in vehicles as part of the entertainment package. In fact, sustainability and entertainment, and I forget what the third one was, were the three strong points that they were promoting in their press event. So Sony in many ways is much different than they were, you know, 15 or 20 or 30 years ago, but they're very much an entertainment business, mm -hmm. just promoting it in different ways. They're facilitating it and they're making it and distributing it. And um, mm -hmm. their TV sets, you know, I'll let you know when I see them. Yeah, and, and speaking of uh, ATSC um, 3.0, um, Hisense, um, not to yep. get confused with Michael Heiss. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's like there were the Hess gas stations, and people used to say you related to them. And I said, no, they forgot the I, and they keep sending the checks somewhere else. Um, yeah, Hisense um, uh, going uh, probably into the late uh, second quarter, early third quarter. We'll be introducing um, TV sets with ATSC 3.0, joining uh, Samsung, Sony, and LG. And uh, hint, hint uh, for the editorial planner, if there's one on the phone here, um, I'm uh, going to be doing a test, uh, uh, which hopefully will appear uh, in the blog, uh, of the Sony, one of the TV sets, Sony TV sets with ATSC 3.0 and the new Tableau over-the-air uh, 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 DVR. So, um, yeah, that's they're, they're really pushing big. Everybody is, and Hisense is a, a very important part. Uh, they're sort of 
new to the big scene. Right. But if you were to look at who the largest uh, TV set brands, they're LG, Samsung, TCL, Vizio, and Hisense, and then Sony. Not because anyone is good or bad, those uh, relate to market conditions, but Samsung is a huge global force in the TV set market. And because of their humble U.S. market beginnings, you know, some people put them down, but uh, they're really going all out. One of the things that they showed was an 8K. They're very big in ultra short throw UST projectors, and they right. promoted that they will be offering an 8K 120 hertz um, no, 8K 60 hertz uh, laser short throw. And that'll be interesting to th- see uh, no price and availability uh, announced, however. And again, look at my notes and there another one. Uh, connected Life Suite, Appliances and TV Integration. That is indeed a growing uh, trend. And, uh, you know, to our uh, readers, viewers, listeners in the, uh, in the residential space, it's going to be interesting to see how these walled gardens interface with the more traditional crestrons and control fours and savants and things of that nature. You know, are those all going to be able to glue together or are they going to just be a cool thing for people to want to go DIY? Yeah. Or are they going to be a headache for, you know, residential professionals? Remains to be seen. Absolutely. Well, before we we move on from uh, ATSC 3.0 completely, can you just explain from your personal experience, um, you you were early on in the over the top and the streaming and all that, where where do you see this fitting in? Is it eliminate the need for like a Roku live TV type of a uh, um, subscription to get that live stuff so you can just do over the air? Can you get a better quality experience from the over the air because of it um, visually? Like, not it, it won't do away with streaming. Right. But the bottom line, the cool thing and the important thing about ATSC 3.0, or as they would like you to say, a uh, next gen TV, is yeah. that it's IP based which means that you could do anything with it. Will it will ATSC 3.0 replace a Roku or a Fire TV stick or an Apple TV, which is to say, will it deliver the premium or paid or um, free services like Pluto that people are used to? It could, but it won't at first. Uh, there's a company called Avoca, which is testing ATSC 3.0 for that very purpose, but that's you know sort of still in one market right now. Advantages of ATSC 3.0, better quality as any over the air uh, signal does. Um, way more flexible captioning and a lot of other control mechanisms, um, sideline, uh, chats and all the things that you can do because it has an internet connection going up and down and it's IP based, it will be able to do, no one is doing it yet, uh, but it's capable of doing 4K. It can do uh, 60 Hertz. It can do uh, HDR in variety of flavors. It's just a tremendously improved viewing experience. Uh, AWARN, which is the latest version of the emergency broadcast system kind of thing. So you don't just get an annoying, you know, noise and a crawl at the bottom of the screen because they know where the TV sets are. They'll be able to say um, a freight train derailed on uh, north of Route 22 and, uh, you know, please evacuate a quicker leak there but you can target it just to the sets in that neighborhood without, you know, making the whole uh, viewing area go bonkers. So it's got some really, really cool uh, things. It's available in Indianapolis now. So you uh, better get on the stick there, Jeremy. And it is finally available after my whining to the ATSC people uh, for years here in LA. So, um, you know, we're definitely going to give you the, uh, 
the user experience. It, it's definitely something in a cord cutting world. You're not going to want to cut the cord to your broadband connection. And this is a way of saying you may want to cut the cord to the cable for video content, but you might want to keep the cord to your outdoor antenna. And ATSC 3.0 is all about that. That's what I was going to ask. So you still that you, you need to have a, a decent antenna outdoors to be able to. Well, no, to no, that, that no, I, 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 I want to be perfectly clear about that. It depends on where you are, you individual viewer in relation to where the transmitter is in, in your area and what the terrain is. So where I live uh, in uh, suburban uh, Los Angeles, I'm about 25 miles, probably less than that, from Mount Wilson, where the uh, local TV transmitters are. Yes, I do have an outdoor antenna, and I can pick up 178 different channels. Now, most of those are digital sub-channels, but mm -hmm. I can pick up over 178 at last chance, uh, last try channels. With the indoor antennas that I've got around the house, I can pick up, oh, it's terrible. I can only pick up about 70 or 80 or 100. Oh, that's definitely not enough. You do not need a new antenna. If you can pick up the local stations, there's no such thing as a digital antenna. Uh, it, it just, antennas are not digital or analog. Mm -hmm. They're things that receive signal. Mm -hmm. There are antennas with higher gain, and there are amplifiers that can assist in that, but there is no such thing and there is no need for a digital antenna, period, end of statement. Okay. Well, to wrap things up, uh, we've covered a lot here, but is there anything that you have in your notes that you want to touch on that we that I didn't ask you about before we go? Uh, let me just check here. Uh, gaming, again, I, I definitely want to... Um, emphasize that gaming is a big thing. Uh, I just want to close out that Next Gen TV is now in 46 markets. Okay. So that's a, a, a big thing. Um, let's see. Um, the Samsung Odyssey Arc, a 55-inch curved monitor that mm. can work in both portrait and landscape mode. Uh, I, I shudder to ask what that's going to cost, but, you know, if you're really a gamer, uh, you know, that's really cool. In terms of AR and VR, one of the things that Sony did, uh, you know, mention, and one of the things that they at least, I think, statically showed in their booth is that in line with PS5, they're coming out with a VR2. Um Again, we'll wait and see what the backwards compatibility is. Uh, I fear not that much, but that's stepping up that game while everybody just debates, you know, when Apple is going to do something. But there, I think the bigger application is going to be AR, not VR, because you want to see what is in real life and have a generated image superimposed on that, uh, the biggest application for that will be heads-up displays uh, in vehicles. Um, more sets capable of BT2020, uh, that's important. Uh, choo, choo, choo. I think that in the amount of time that we have, that pretty much wraps it up as far as I'm concerned. Well, thank you, Michael. It's always uh, fun to hear your perspective on this stuff. Uh, and uh, I, I, I just wanted to say again, Michael Heiss is a CDA Lifetime Achievement Award winner, fellow fellow for CDA, uh, video expert uh, and contributing editor to Residential Tech Today. Thank you so much. Best of luck for 2022 and I appreciate your insights, Michael. Same to you. Thank you. And uh, stay well, Jeremy, and uh, stay well, everybody. That wraps up today's show. If you're new to Residential Tech Talks, please subscribe 
to the weekly podcast on your preferred platform and consider rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts. Also, check out all the latest residential tech news at the magazine's website, restechtoday.com, where you can also subscribe to the bi-monthly print or digital magazine and to our Tuesday and Friday email newsletters. Until next time, please stay safe, stay inspired, and let us know if you have a great story to tell. Residential